Greetings, welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Harry Fricker. This evening we've got a star guest, Carolyn Kennett, archaeoastronomer. Um, we'll, and she will be talking about ancient sites on Bodmin Moor, the Hurlers and on Rao Tor. And um, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, of, of just a couple of announcements before we make a start, We've got a couple, if you could indicate that, where you're, you, where, where, where you're actually listening from, where you're watching the, the live stream, that would be absolutely brilliant. That would give us an idea of where, 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 you, where, where you're at, of our, of our audience. Um, Kim, welcome. Hi, from Wales. That's excellent, Kim. Wonderful. Holly, from the New Forest. That's brilliant. Welcome, Holly. Thank you for being here. Roy, hi, I'm from London. Hi, Roy. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Holly, that countdown is making me excited. Excellent. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much for being here, folks. So yes, other people, if you could actually tell us where you're from, where you're watching us from, that would be absolutely brilliant. Stuart, Bodmin Moor, just down the road from us. Excellent. Hello, Stuart. Thank you for joining the live stream. Okay. In terms of, uh, of, of um, <clears throat> the live streams, um, it's, I would strongly suggest if you actually can, um, subs if you'd like to subscribe to the YouTube channel, that will be great <clears throat> because then you'll get an announcement whenever I upload a new, <clears throat> a new video. Other than that, uh, you can actually follow me on Eventbrite and then you will also be advised, notified when a new, um, when a new program is going to be uh, up, up, uploaded. And the other way to actually get advised is to join the mailing list. <clears throat> and um, any of those three ways is, is absolutely fine. Carolyn B from Leicester. Hello, Carolyn. Thank you for joining us. Marcy, hello from Seattle. Wow, the other side of the Atlantic. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Marcy. Tim, hello from Washington, D.C., U.S. Absolutely wonderful. Even further away, the other side, the Pacific Coast. That's absolutely brilliant. Leslie, hello from Sri Lanka. This is absolutely fantastic. Leslie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for joining us. This is absolutely great. Cool. Okay, <clears throat> without further ado, <clears throat> I'll move the scene to introduce um, Carolyn. I think I might have to do a, a, a new setup, but um, bear with me. Oh, no, it's all okay. There, Carolyn, fantastic. Thank you so much for being here this evening. It's wonderful to see you. Hi, Harry, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I recognize the few uh, names that were coming up then, so it's great that you could all drop in and come and hear me chat a bit more about what we've got planned for this year and also a little bit more about some of the things that I've been researching over on Bodmin Moor. Um, Fantastic. Folks, just a couple of just a couple of things. Um, in terms of questions and comments, please send questions in and comments as we go along. Don't wait until the end, because the format of In Conversation is that a lot of this is unscripted and we actually weave your comments and questions into the conversation. So that way it's, it's, it's a kind of, it has a natural flow. So don't wait until the end. If a question comes up, just far away and then we'll actually retake it as, um, as, as things progress, as things move along. So that's absolutely fine. So um, Carolyn and I will actually just kick off giving you an outline, a quick outline, five minute outline of the photography archaeology workshops that we have, we have planned in collaboration and they will be taking place uh, as from uh, late March onwards. Um, the photography workshops are, <clears throat> are an innovative approach to photography and archaeology as a matter of fact. Nobody else is offering these here. So this is, is a unique opportunity to join us in a photographic, archaeological and ast archaeoastronomical adventure in Bodmin Moor. We'll be kicking off 
uh, with a photography exercise in terms of framing and composition, in terms of creative image making. Then we'll move on, uh, that will take about an hour, then we'll move on to actually doing some things that are more technical and creative, actually taking photographs. And from then onwards, uh, we'll actually shift gear and that is where Carolyn will, will, will come in and, 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 and do her bit. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to, at that point, Harry's going to deliver all the photography side of the workshops, but I, I, we will be doing it out in the field. So the intention is to do a day around the Hurlers landscape and then move on for a, a second day around Rautor. Um, there is a huge wealth of archaeological remains in both areas, and they've been choose, chosen for a variety of reasons for access, for ease of access for people, because we understand that we'll be carrying quite a bit of equipment with us, but also um, because of the beauty of the landscape itself and the opportunity to look at the archaeological sites uh, within the landscape and also the skyscape above them, so the framing of that sky above them. And if we do get clear skies for that evening, the intention is to move on and do some um, evening and nighttime low light photography as well. Definitely. So, certainly catching things like um, the sunset on the first evening, that will be absolutely, you know, fantastic. Um, also getting sunrise the following day. That would be absolutely brilliant, and and doing some some astrophotography that will be absolutely you know a great great bonus. Obviously, this depends on 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 the weather. We'll be either taking for lunch. We'll be taking either a packed lunch or going to one of the local pubs. Um, in the evenings, we'll probably go to one of the local pubs as well. Um, the workshops don't include accommodation, so that gives you the absolute freedom to choose the kind of accommodation that is right for you, your style and budget. And there's many accommodations to actually choose from, from four five-star hotels, bed and breakfast, um, Airbnb, you name it. There's a lot of things available. So um, if you need some support with, with accommodation, do give me a call. I can actually point you in the right direction. I can give you some right, get some right clues, websites, and so on and so forth. And if you have any questions, either related, pertaining to photography or uh, uh, astro uh, archaeology and as archaeoastronomy, um, contact Carolyn. So that's absolutely fine. Feel free to contact us. That's absolutely fine. Okay, just a couple of other comments. Anything else you'd like to add, Carolyn? Uh, no, no, that's fine. Um, yeah. I'm just really excited about working with you, Harry. So. Cool. Yes, so am I. This is really, this is really interesting. We've had this in the pipeline for some time, and finally, it's it's coming into fruition. Um, so far, it's good. We've had a number of inquiries, so that's absolutely great. And we've only just launched this initiative, so it's fantastic. If things go well, we aim to expand this provision to the west of Cornwall. That is also very, very, very rich in in in, in archaeology. It's a, so it's a fantastic opportunity. Comment from John. John Webb, back again from Toronto. Hello, John. Yes, I remember you. Thank you for, for joining us. And Mike from Broxburn, Hertfordshire. Hi there. Hello, Mike. Thank you for being here this evening. Cool. Okay. Carolyn, what do you think if we move on to the slides? Yep. Excellent. Yep, um, so I wanted to start by... Um, really demonstrating the amazing landscape that Bodmin Moor has. Um, this photograph I, I took um, in December on a nice clear morning and it's got um, this amazing feature at the front which is a partly natural, so the stack in the middle is a partly natural stack called Showery Tor. Round it is a man-made cairn of stones. It's um, a very large man-made structure, about 30 metres in diameter, about three metres in height. Um, to the right of it, you have the large rocky outcrop of Rautor. And then in the background to the left near the sun is um, Brown Willy or Bronwynne, which is the largest hill within Cornwall. And for me, um, they epitomise some of the best that Bodmin Moor has to offer. Um, 
But I'm first of all going to move us back right over the other side of Bodmin Moor, because Bodmin Moor is quite a large expanse of land. It's um, got more moorland than anywhere else in Cornwall, and um, it's a slightly smaller scale than Dartmoor, but it's still got wonderful opportunities to get out into some real areas of wilderness. Um, so, Harry, if you want to flip over to the next slide. And there we go. So this second one is on the other side of the moor, and this is showing the hurlers. Um, this was taken from a drone shot back in about 2018. And um, I A technical glitch here. Yes, you're back. Excellent. Thank you, Carolyn. Good. I keep dropping out, Harry, so I will drop back in as quick as I can. Yes, that's absolutely fine. It's all part of the technology. Yeah, you're here. That's what really matters. <laughs> so, so the Hurlers is um, a wonderful Bronze Age triple stone circle site. And um, it's, it's built on the hillside, uh, running up a slope which runs to the north north. Sorry about this glitch, folks. Okay, you were saying the hillside. Um, within the three stone circles, between the middle and the upper circle, is an interesting monument called, uh, which was named the Pavement Stone. Uh, around it, there are a number of other features. So, up on the hillside, uh, if you were follow through the three stone circles, you, you get to a very large barrow on the other side called Willerton Barrow, which um, within they found some uh, really significant finds, including a golden cup and a shell in turn. It's not been fully excavated, only part of the barrow has been excavated. Um, you can actually see it out of the centre uh, right of the image there, the hump on the skyline. Um, the focus of the, of the ancient site um, is quite interesting because it has a number of natural large hills around it, such as uh, Stowe Hill, which has a Neolithic Stowe House, which is um, behind my head on the left there. Once again, like Showery Tor, it has a, a natural feature um, called the Cheese Ring, which is a stack of those stones. So, um, it seems to be that um, the people within these uh, early prehistoric periods, the Bronze Age and the Neolithic, were, were interested in the landscape which was directly linked to, to these rocky outcrops and these interesting natural features. And um, within that, it's, it's always draw, drawing your eye line upwards. And um, I was asked to be involved to do an astronomical assessment of some of the features at the hurlers, and it's incredibly complex as a site. So you, ha as I say, there is multiple monuments at the site. Um, and when I started to look at the whole of the landscape and the way things were positioned and things, it, it became very apparent to me that I would have to separate little bits out and have a look at them, or rather than um, try and understand the complexities as a whole. And one of the things, if Harry can flip on the slides again, one of the things that we, we went and had a look at was this pavement, which um, fell between the middle and the upper circle. And you can see um, a, a, the two circles there side by side. So this is a triple circle site, but these are the upper and the middle circle. And in between them, um, we've got two people rolling out a yellow piece of cloth. Now, the reason why we um, were doing that and taking photographs is because this pavement um, had been excavated back in the 1930s and then it had been re-excavated in 2013 and then recovered back over with turf. And by the time we came to look at um, whether it had any astronomical significance, um, it had already been recovered up with the turf. So, one of the things about the pavement was that it's all different 
types of stone. So there's um, a multitude of different types of stone used to make up this feature. And most of the stone have been placed into local yellow clay. And the stones were all different colours. So they were white stones, there were bits of quartz, there was some blue, and there were some reddy coloured stones. And they seem to have been positioned very deliberately in um, a very straight uh, line between these two circles with um, a larger stone blocking the Tiber end. It was felt that the pavement, because of the, the way the stones were bumpy and ridgy, was never made to be walked upon. And rather, people would have walked either side of it. And maybe it was a monument which evolved over time as people placed stones within the, this feature um, over a number of years. And um, it's such an interesting feature at this stone circle. And I, it's not one that I've, I know of being replicated elsewhere. One of the things that happened when it was exposed back in 2013 was someone said, oh, it looks a little bit about like the Milky Way. And that's because of the different coloured stones used within the, the monument itself, but also because um, at, at one end of, of the stone pavement, it actually splits and straddles, almost like the Milky Way does with, with the dark area called the Cygnus Rift. And we started to look at the axis of the site and the position of the Milky Way during the course of the year, and we started to draw conclusions from that. But this this part of the experiment with the pavement was looking about low. Here we are. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we were looking at, at the yellow cloth under low light conditions and we took a drone up and we photographed the drone as the um, sunset and during um, different conditions that evening. So it was a completely clear night. Um, Bodmin Moor, we should say, is a dark sky park, so it, it, it is relatively free of light pollution. But this, this evening in particular, there was going to be a full moon rising um, about an hour after the sunset. So we, we had an opportunity to photograph under pure darkness and then photograph under moonlight. And we wanted to see if, if there was any difference um, for the yellow cloth against the stones themselves. And we, we did find that there was some uh, element of being, um, being able to visually see the yellow cloth in, in the true darkness. And certainly once that moon rose, um, we felt that there was some element of maybe being able to see the yellow cloth more than the surrounding stones. So it, it might have been a feature which which had been um, visualised under low light, but it, that didn't seem to be the key to the to the whole um, monument itself. W what we felt instead was um, the way that the Milky Way was positioned, particularly in in springtime, so around the equinox and um, it would rise out of Rillerton Barrow at the top of the hillside and it would lie flat against the eastern horizon before um, the end of the Milky Way would um, reach the southern end on the horizon against the southern end of those circles if you were to use it as an axis running that up and down the hill. And as the course of the evening went on, the Milky Way would then arch up and above the three circles themselves. Now, the Milky Way, um, there's a lot of folklore around the Milky Way, particularly um, it, with other cultures. But even if we get more localized to Ireland and, and folklore around um, the Milky Way, mo uh, most cultures um, tie it into being a river in the sky or a pathway in the sky or a route in the sky. Many of those have layers of adding on that it's a, a route or a pathway um, that their dead take, or maybe that it's their ancestors themselves that have been positioned in the sky. So um, certainly in Australia and places, um, some of the Aboriginal tribes think that the stars are campfires that their ancestors are stopping at on, on a route to, to the afterlife. And we felt that it was interesting at this springtime that the Milky Way would be lying flat against the horizon as, as darkness fell. 
Sorry about that, folks. Carolyn will be back imminently. Am I all back? Yes. You can hear me, Harry. Yes, I can hear you fine. Go ahead. Before it rises up and arcs overhead. And and although the Milky the position of the Milky Way has, has moved since those Bronze Age periods, we, we were able to recreate that in planetarian software. There's still wonderful opportunities at the Hurlers themselves to go and see uh, the Milky Way ab ab above the Hurlers because of the dark sky opportunities. That, um, that was all put into an academic paper. If um, I can share that link if anyone wants to know where they can find out more about that. Do you want to move on to the next slide, Harry? Sorry. Yeah, before we move on, Carolyn, just a, 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 somebody that's joined us. Joe, hello from Cornwall. Hello, Joe. Thank you for joining us. That's great. And a question from Holly. Please, could you explain the pits around there? Has there been any Mesolithic activity found? Um, just a note about the Mesolithic. The Mesolithic is the era before the Neolithic. The Neolithic is the, the beginning of uh, the agricultural revolution. And before that is the Mesolithic, when the um, when we are looking at um, societies, communities that were still hunter-gatherers. Over to you, Carolyn. Okay, so um, the pits, um, there's, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting landscape, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by the pits, but um, there are certain industrial archaeological remains where they have um, scooped out for bits of mining along that hillside. Then there is also remains of people training there in the Second World War. So there's multiple layers of archaeology a lot on this hillside. There's not just prehistory there. Um, but to answer your question about the Mesolithic, so one of the issues um, that the archaeologists had when they excavated at the Hurlers was the extensive dating of the artifacts coming out of the Hurlers themselves. So in the pavement, there were flints that had been found which date to the Mesolithic, so, um, which was fascinating. They don't actually believe that the pavement itself, they think the pavement would have been comparable in age to the circle, so late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, but somehow there were further remains on that hillside which were Mesolithic, which, which show that people were interested in that landscape much before that, um, they were building the monuments there and leaving their marks in stone behind. Um, okay, Harry, if you want to flip on to the next one. Excellent. One other message from Joanna. Joe, good to be here. Excellent. Thank you. I'm glad, Joe. Thank you for being yeah. here. That's great. OK, moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> he says. And uh, oh, another message from Holly. Just wondered if there were lunar calendar stuff. Thanks. Um, yeah, the, it's not something that we did a huge amount. There isn't any um, lunar alignments, horizontal alignments at the Hurlers. Um, there isn't any evidence for that. There is at some of the other sites on Bodmin Moor. So the Stripple Stones um, has a, a big rocky outcrop called Hawk's Tor just above it. And that's in the position of one of the lunar standstill positions, um, which su suggests that they had an interest in um, lunar alignments. Um, but yeah, the hurlers themselves, as I said, there was nothing particularly at the hurlers which screened lunar alignments to us. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there, it's just that we didn't find them when we were looking at the bits that we were looking at. So Harry, if you flip on to the next one. Um, so this was a, an, another interesting theory about the hurlers, a, a triple circle and people start thinking about stars and um, you start to think about Orion's belt. And this is someone um, stood up on a localized hill. Um, Minions is the village with the little street lights and little house lights on. Beyond Minions, you can see three torches lit up. And they are torches of people stood in the stone circles themselves to demonstrate this uh, spatial relationship with Orion's belt. 
Now, we did look at um, the position of Orion um, at the time that the circles were being built and, and laid out in the landscape. And unfortunately, we couldn't find any relationship with um, the positions of the tours and the outcrops and the, the rising Orion or the setting Orion. But it, it is an interesting theory, probably needs some more development work around it uh, as to whether those three circles could have been laid out. Um, nope, sorry about that, folks. You're back, excellent. Yeah, <laughs> with a nod towards Orion. Um, okay, Harry, if you want to flip on. And so this this was the evening of the yellow cloth, so and that was the full moon rising. So these are the types of things that you can start playing around with photographically up there, um, illuminating some of the stones with torches. So it, it's quite funny that picture because I always think if it's a sun, your shadows are going in the wrong direction. But you know, at, at once you get darkness, you can make some really extensive shadows and things and um, take some nice images of the moon um, rising up. Okay, Harry, and we'll move on. Harry? Ah, there we go. Okay, so th this monument is just um, down the road. Um, this is one of the oldest stone monuments in um, Cornwall. And it's a, a, a coit or a, a type of dolmen. And um, this one is quite a large one, Trevisi coit. And it's on the edges of Bodmin Moor. So it's not on those moorland areas. This one's actually set next to a, quite a, a small village. And it was recently excavated. And they had a fascinating find of it being positioned on a greenstone platform, um, which is really, really fascinating. But one of the interesting features for me as an archaeoastronomy is uh, the hole in the, the top of the capstone there. And um, I went and had a look at this uh, with a friend and we went, uh, we were lucky to, enough to be on Bodmin Moor uh, a, a midsummer's day a few years ago. And uh, we went along um, at just gone 20 past one and took these photographs where the sun actually rose high enough in the sky to send this beam of light down onto the shadow on the ground. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see this dot, this uh, beam of uh, sunlight on, on the shadow itself. Now, whether that's something that they were trying to do, we just found it quite interesting because the hole itself um, doesn't seem to have any explanation, any practical explanation as to why it would have been put into the capstone and it would have taken quite a significant amount of work to do. Um, why it was 20 past one? Well, we're on British summertime by then, so um, you go an hour ahead and we're also that 20 minutes further west from, from London. So that's um, instead of being midday on Midsummer's Day, which is the highest point the sun would reach, we, we, we moved on the clock a little bit to 20 past one. Um, but yeah, that's something you can go down and have a look yourself and sit see where the sun is. Um, as I say, we were very lucky to have a, a clear day that day and lots of nice sunshine. Um, Harry, if you want to move on and we'll move back to the other side of the moor. So back to Showery Tor. So this is very similar. Um, the, the actual feature itself is very similar to the cheese ring feature, which you find above the hurlers themselves and, and once again it seems that people particularly with showery and its relationship um it it has a a long ridge that way leading to this rocky outcrop called Rautor and um Rautor itself seems to be a major focus for for a lot of the ancient sites in that area and um this one as i say has had this huge um man-made cairn built around the feature itself and um, if we flip then on to the next one because under Showery Tor and leading up to Showery Tor is another cairn but this is a long thin stretch of cairn which is man-made again um, 
it's very easy to mistake this when you're stood um, away from it as a field boundary. But this, this one was um, identified as a long can. Um, it comes in three, three lengths. So there's a longer strip at the bottom, which is this one, which directly leads up to Showery Tor. Then there's a midsection, which leads up to Little Row Tor. And then a smaller end section, which doesn't seems to be a bit less defined, and that leads off in another direction toward in between the main hilltop of Rautor and Little Rautor. Um, this lower section was excavated on Time Team um, back in about 2014, and they tried to do some dating, but um, it, it came up with some inconclusive results. But the bit that they were excavating had also been used as a passing point in World War II, where they dug out and um, they'd used it to run um, armoured vehicles and things like that through the cairn itself. Um, but what they'd actually managed to do was when they dug into the cairn and, and looked at it in cross-section, they, they found that it was almost like a platform um, built up on either side with sides to it and this platform cairn, which people could have walked upon itself up and down this hillside. Um, for me, the, the, the interesting thing about this um, object was when I got pointed up the hill from stood at the bottom, and the first section, the longest section of it, runs directly up to Showery Tor, and that interesting feature that we just saw. Um, I then started doing some calculations in my head as to when the sunrise would be um, directly over Showery Tor. And I went down um, and it was just a couple of days after um, the beginning of November. So I think this one, these images were taken on the 3rd of November. And you can see that that sunrise is just coming to the right of Showery Tor itself. Um, it would have actually been more over Showery Tor if we were to look back in history because there is, has been a slight change in the position of the sun. So there is a suggestion that people were interested in the position of this and the rising sun. And when we go on to the next section, Harry, if you can pull up the next slide, please. Um, the next section, as I say, runs, it changes direction and it runs to that middle outcrop on Rautor, which is little Rautor. And these pictures were then taken on the winter solstice. So once again, the sun is slightly off, um, but what, what um, would have happened was when you rewind history, it would have risen out of Little Rautor itself. So maybe people were enjoying walking up this long can uh, on certain significant days. Um, it's it's a, in a really interesting position on the moor. If you um, go off to the right towards Loudon Hill, an area called Loudon Hill, you get a huge amount of hut circles and um, where people have lived. Um, but this area as well is all, always um, in the morning, the last part of the moor to be illuminated. So when you're stood on this, waiting for the sun to rise out, uh, above that rocky outcrop, it's quite dark and cold. And you can see the sunlight illuminating the fields all around you and the other rocky outcrops and things and then you see the sun racing towards you across the fields in front of you if you were to face the other direction as it's coming up over the fields and then it comes up and fi the final thing you do see is you turn around and you actually see the sun rise and shine down the cairn itself. Now if you were to walk up the cairn as the sun is rising, so Harry if you flip it on, um, you get these interesting sh things where you can then turn yourself around and you can make your shadow extend the length and all the way down this long cairn itself, um, in, in effect, making yourself a giant of a person. So I'm sure these are all things that, that they would have been interested with and experimenting with and things. But these, these are the kinds of little ideas that I, I get going in my head when I'm out there. Um, I think, yeah, wouldn't it be fun to see what happens to my shadow? And, I, I walked up the cairn after the sun rose and, and turned around and, and my shadow was there extending the length of it all the way back down the hill, um, which is kind of a, a, a fun discovery. Um, Harry, if you click on. Absolutely. This is, this is, this is quite amazing, actually. <clears throat> um, 
the shadow and we have a comment from Holly cool it's like cinematography of the landscape yes yeah. it's it's something that is actually quite playful and quite um, quite human in a way and it's it it, it has a yeah. lovely lovely touch of warmth and empathy uh, which I absolutely love that's brilliant next slide so um that's Rao Tor again in the background, but from a different angle. So it's now looking more like this is the far end of it, this rocky pyramid peak of Rao Tor. And this is uh, one of the localized um, circles. So there are quite a number of stone circles, standing stone, can, um, stone rows, there's everything on this landscape, all the hut circles, huge plethora of hut circles and field boundaries. Um, this was a well used landscape. So if you were to come to this stone circle, which is Fernacre, um, Fernacre, <coughs> sorry, Fernacre um, has a, about 55 stones left in it. There was probably 70 odd when it was um, originally built, I think. But it's on this nice expanse of land with quite decent views, but it, once again dominated by Rao Tor. Um, to the north um, and Fernacre seems to have been cardinally aligned so Rautor itself is directly north of the circle whereas the other large hill um, Brown Willy is directly east and seems to be in the equinox position so there seems to be some deliberate pricing of this circle to do with um, the position of the sun and the position of these cardinal points and that's also very similar to the next stone circle which is harry brings up the next one so we've got this other beautiful stone circle so there's can i just can i just comment yeah. on or make a comment before we move on folks yeah. this is i'd like to draw your attention to this this particular this particular landscape here on um <clears throat> Um, Fernacre Stone Circle. I photograph quite a lot. This well, I photograph all these areas that Carolyn has been referring to. But what really struck me is that this spot here, this part of the landscape on Bodmin Moor, has remained unchanged over a period of practically millennia. I'm just saying, Carolyn, that this this spot here. Or where Fernacre is, has has we we could almost say that it's remained unchanged for a period of millennia. This is how it is, and I think it's this is what really is something that is striking. Because if you live in a city, you go away from it for five, ten years, you come back, you don't recognize it. This place hasn't changed, and I think this is what gives uh, Bodmin more its characteristic spirit of place. But enough of me, man. Let move. Um, yeah, so this is the next um, next stone circle that I want to talk about. There is another one which actually comes in between these two called Loudon, um, but I'm not going to show pictures of that because it's not not as impressive as this one. Or Loudon's very dilapidated and in a very interesting position. Once again, it's um, that's another one which seems to have a, a lunar alignment um, with Rao Tor, so a bit like uh, I said, Stripple had with Hawks Tor. Uh, Loudon seems to have a, a, a lunar relationship with Rautor. So this one um, uh, is uh, Stannon and it's in quite good condition. So um, very typical Bodmin Moor stone circle with quite small stones, um, quite plentiful of stones. So I think there's 50 odd stones in this one. Um, difficult to count when they get partially buried under the peak. But once again, you can see Rautor there um, to the back left of this image and um, if you look there's this triangular stone at the front of Sanon and, and that triangular stone has a notch in it and as you can see on Rao Tor itself it also has a notch and if you were to go down um, at the beginning of May uh, at what would be known as the Celtic Festival of Beltane the, the notch on the, the triangular stone of Sanon lines up with the notch of Rao Tor once again offering an, um, this idea that people were interested in different divisions of, of the calendar year. And um, there's a, also an interesting thing about Stannon, which I find really interesting, is 
it's something that you see and it's something that you probably only see when you, you start to walk around the landscape quite a bit is what can just be seen in the landscape rather than what is um, there and also what is missing so what can just be seen here is is the rocky outcrop of brown willy this huge huge um hill which sits behind Rao Tor. the rocky the top rocky outcrop of brown willy this other of a large hill can just be seen over the horizon and this is something that is often found at some of the circles on bodmin moor and certainly at laskernic um Rautor just peeks behind slightly out out the back of the ridgeway of brown willy so it seems that that was something that interested them as sorry folks carolyn will be back very shortly excellent thank you you're back um so so yeah so so they were very interested in the landscape and this almost playfulness of where the positions of um certain hills and tours were and what could be seen what was missing um, and those are the types of things that i go and look for when i'm on a site so if, if you're on a site and something like rao tour really dominates and as you start walking around all of the different features, is Rouse Tour still dominating the skyline or has it become less of a feature or have they made it slightly hide away? And those, those are the types of things that interest me as well. Um, if we go on to the uh, next slide, Harry, I think it's my last slide. So this one again is Rautor. Uh, you can see that dominant hill in this landscape. And um, this is my uh, partner in crime, Jamie, and he stood on Loudon Hill. And this is a Logan stone. So this is kind of another fun thing in the landscape. These are the types of things that I kind of really enjoy as well. So a Logan stone is something that you climb on and you can rock back and forth. And uh, we do have a number of Logan stones and we even have places in Cornwall called Logan Tone and, and things but yeah they, they are playful things that seem to have been focuses for people within this landscape so between where he stood on that stone and Rautor itself is where the majority of the hut circles are and what is interesting is a huge amount of those hut circles have their doorways facing that Logan Stone it's almost like they wanted to frame um, as they opened their doors in the morning, the first thing they saw was this fun object that was in, in the landscape. And um, it's worth going out and having a look at some of those huts and seeing what direction those doors. I, I got told this by an archaeologist, um, Peter Herring, and I, I went down and did this. And it was absolutely fascinating to go around and, and see that and, and see that they had kind of a, an interesting mindset about these things and, and enjoyed them perhaps as much as we do as well. And um, I think that's me done chatting about all the fun things that I like in, in those two areas. And um, yeah, I'm sure Harry might have some things to add or if there's any questions. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Carolyn. That's absolutely brilliant. Folks, if you have any comments or questions, please go ahead. Um, this is, this is your, your, your chance to ask questions. Um, that's an incredible presentation. Thank you so much. It's really detailed and your, your wealth of knowledge is, is absolutely fabulous. I'm, I'm, I'm astounded. I love it. Um, uh, and bear in mind, folks, that also during our photography and archaeology workshops, we will be looking at all, if not most, of this, uh, these sites that Carolyn has spoken about um, this evening so this will be a great opportunity to actually go there and i think that one of the things that is fascinating for me photographing on this landscape is the the the, the scale the intimacy and the proximity that you can actually reach you can walk uh, you you can just just sit there stand there take it all in, take the landscape in. And um, that in itself is an amazing, amazing um, um, feeling, an amazing sensation. But also having the knowledge of the alignments and the playfulness that Carolyn mentioned in, in, in the landscape, um, I think that kind of brings these monuments to a kind of different perspective, more of a, a human perspective, um, we're talking of, you know, they are us, we are them. Couple of comments have just come in. Lila, 
really interesting and lovely pictures. Thank you, Lila. Yes. John Webb, it's hard to estimate how many people were required to construct the circles and quoits. Good question. Yeah, I, I agree with you, John. Um, I think some of the smaller circles could, were local communities, but the quoits themselves were massive undertakings. Um, the capstones on some of them are incredibly heavy. And yeah, I don't think we really understand how they achieve some of these things. So, so amazing. Yeah. It's quite, it's quite because it, I've been thinking about this as well in my visits there. And especially when we look at the, 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 the early one, the, the, the quoit, the Trithevi quoit, that's a huge capstone. I think it weighs about seven yeah. or eight tons. Yeah. Um, so it's not just the, the sourcing of the stones, the cutting them out, the transporting them, but then the putting them together in this jigsaw puzzle. And bear in mind that they're also aligned. So it, it must have been a huge endeavor, a huge investment of time and human resources and everything by design. This wasn't something that was, was haphazard or willy-nilly. This was something that was, 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 was planned and, and designed and it fits within a particular style and approach. So it's, it's a mammoth undertaking. And, and I think, again, being at these sites and actually having that closeness actually um, stimulates you to start thinking about these things and in my perspective, it really enables you to connect with the landscape or begin to connect with the landscape in a way that is, um, but from my experience, it's quite magical because I think that is, to me, that's the attraction of it. Question or comment from Carolyn B. It is a dark sky area, but do the skies get as dark as they would have been when the stones were placed? Uh, so there are some light domes uh, from Bodmin Town and uh, Liskard uh, at the Hurlers, but so in. Oops. Karen will be back shortly. Here we are. Good. So, yeah, so I'm just saying there are some um, distant light domes um, from those surrounding towns to the park. But, and there are some villages within the, the Bodmin Moor itself. There is also uh, the A30, which is over the top. So, no, it wouldn't be as dark as um, in the right time. But we have to think that people would have also had certain amount of fires and reliance on um, light that they would create themselves after dark. Um, I know that's a, a different type of light and it would have been very low level and things, but um, no, I, I suppose in essence, no, they're not as dark as they would have been in prehistoric times. And that, that is unfortunate, but yeah, if they're as dark as, as, you know, they're dark enough to have got this dark sky status. So they're fantastically dark um, for surrounding areas and things so we're, we're very lucky yes on that note of the darkness it's 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 areas like here near Rao Tor, then we're actually quite deep into into Bodmin more and there you actually see light on on, on the periphery on the horizon um, and you did you do you do get a bit of stray light but not that that much um, especially if you go on a night of new moon when it's really dark um, then Bodmin more. Then you you actually get to get the feeling that, that of that darkness that is pre gaslight, pre electricity, that kind of medieval darkness that is al al almost absolute. That is actually quite quite fascinating. However, on nights of full moon, you could almost read a book, right? You could almost read a text, a newspaper, um, because it actually is, is, is quite right. Nevertheless, the, the kind of um, uh, light pollution that we get in, in cities is, 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 is nowhere near like, nowhere near what you actually get in Bodmin Moor. On Bodmin Moor, you can view the Milky Way 
with the naked eye. Once you once, once you actually get accustomed to the darkness on a, on, on, on a moonless night, you can actually see the Milky Way. And it's absolutely awesome because literally you can trace the whole thing across across the sky. And, um, and again, that, that's an awesome, awesome experience. Another question from Kim. Do you get a pavement like that elsewhere in Cornwall? Uh, no, um, the pavement, uh, as I say, it's called a pavement in inverted commas because um, it's fairly unique. I, I think there is um, a couple of places where there are stone circles with can, uh, rocks put at the base. And I, I certainly know when I visited Nalv in Ireland where um, where they reconstructed Newgrange with the quartz stone at the front, they chose to keep the quartz stone at the base of the entrance of Nalva Island. And if I think of something that's going to be most comparable to what's on the ground there, it's that idea of rocks on the ground, much as they are in front of Nalva in Ireland. Um, but I know that they've been positioned back there um, in more recent times when the excavations were made. Um, but it, it's it's a fascinating and very unusual monument, and yeah, we're always looking for things that might be fairly comparable to it. But there, there doesn't seem to be much, unless anyone. Oops. Here we are. Anything? Uh, any other examples? always fascinating to hear the got other places where they've seen things that are, are comfortable um, but yeah it is very unusual um, and one thing that I, I found unusual as well is they, they never excavated between the southern and the central circle so there could be a similar pavement running between those two or even above that upper circle leading to Rillerton um, they've never um, done a large scale scale excavation of that upper end. There could be another section to it somewhere on that hillside that they've just never discovered. Uh, um, there's always more to be found in these places. I think we are incredibly privileged to actually have um, this these sites at Bodmin Moor because they are amongst the best preserved prehistoric sites in Britain upland in, in in upland terrain the best preserved prehistoric sites um, which is absolutely amazing and it's just around the corner for us to, so to actually be able to 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 explore these places um, you're looking at something that has actually survived from around 4000 BC to this day um, in some cases um, it, 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 it's almost survived um, untouched or, 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 or practically untouched so it's really really amazing so you know do join us for for, for the photography workshops um, Holly this is a comment do you think that motivation of settlement is persuade guided by liminal places rather than resources how comparable do you see land versus sky as landscape? I don't know how quite to start on that one, Holly. <laughs> um, I think that people were motivated by settlement by, um, yeah, that there's certainly a motivation to live in these spaces. Now, the um, the ones by Rautor, the huts there, were probably more seasonal, more transhumance type huts where people would be living and watching uh, livestock over the summer months before moving back off the um, the hillside. I think there was a real practicality to it. Um, if you want to pop that back up, Harry, just so I can read the second half of it, I did like it. I'm not sure I understand the last sentence. How comparable do you see land versus sky as landscape? Um, I suppose 
for me, um, the sky is part of the landscape. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, I, I don't see an ending to one and a begin beginning of the other. I, I think that they are all part of the same thing. It's just that the, the sky, what, what you see in the sky is, is um, changing probably quicker and um, with more regularity than um, what you would see in the landscape. So you would see seasonality in the landscape, but you would also see such seasonality in the sky, but in a different way. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Holly. But... Harry, I can't hear you. Sorry, I muted myself there. Sorry, I'll start again. I was talking to myself there. Monologue. In the couple of texts that I've read, a few texts that I've read um, regarding Bodmin Moor, but also Dartmoor, I've read that 4000 BC, the weather was warmer. However, I don't know how much warmer. Now, that's something interesting. So it, was, it wasn't as cold or as wet as it is now. No, that's the first thing. Also, you need to consider, Holly, that these places were inhabited over periods of millennia. Right? So Carolyn mentioned that in the pavement uh, on the hurlers, they found Mesolithic uh, tools and arrowheads and other objects. So they've been since they, these places have been there since the late Mesolithic, throughout the Neolithic, and into the Bronze Age. They were there for these people were there for millennia. And one of the things that really struck me, and 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 and, and just can't get over it, is that there's practically no evidence of them living there. They've left this very, very, very little. The, sh the arrowhead, the odd axe, the, sh the bit of shard of pottery here, there. Practically no human remains. Very, very few. A bit of charcoal here and there. Um, and, and, and that's it. Um, and I think when you juxtapose that in, um, with, 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 with what we are doing now in the Anthropocene, in where in the last 100, 150 years, we're burying ourselves in our own rubbish. Um, sorry, I'm going into a bit of a tangent, but that is something actually to consider. So yes, the motivation to actually be on the land and to belong of the, in the land and to create these monuments that are very much about belonging to the land, heritage, um, I think, yes, the land played a, a huge run, and I totally agree with Carolyn that what's the difference between the land and the sky? Well, there is none, really, especially for, for, for an agrarian society. Tim, so excited to hear about the workshops. How similar are the sites on Bodmin Moor to elsewhere in Cornwall, such as Penwith? Hi Tim. Um, yeah, so there's some similarities. We have stone circles at both ends. Uh, the, the, the coit um, is similar, but Bodmin Moor is a, a larger expanse of space where I think you get more of a feel of how the landscape played a part with how they were moving and um, choosing where to site these monuments. And um, Penwith, um, there's much more focus on the sea as well. So you've got that added element of, of the coastline and um, the, the access to the sea and what the sea meant to the people in Penwith. Whereas here, we're with this landlocked area of very upland area. So it, it, it's got some similarities, but there are certainly some differences as well. Um, but yeah, so a lot of the monuments are, are, are similar in some ways, but yeah, certainly the um, the stone circles are slightly different in that they contain many more stones and they... Oops, sorry about that. Here we are. Hello. I was just saying the stone circles tend to have smaller stones on Bodmin Moor. They, they have slightly larger diameters. Um, they, there has been the suggestion that 
thing to predate the stone circles in West Cornwall, but there uh, isn't the archaeological evidence to back that up, so the dating to back that up as yet. Um, you also get some really interesting things down west that you don't get on Hodnid Moor, so you get the courtyard house villages and the Fogus, but they're not evidence on, on Bodmin Moor. You get the uh, colonial style passage graves on West Cornwall that are but equally, as I say, Bogny and more, you get these inspected landscapes with these monuments that are embedded in them. Yeah, it makes a fascinating, fascinating stuff. But, uh, Excellent. <clears throat> Comment from Kim. The acoustics by Fernacre are fab. I stood in the circle and could be heard talking from the road. Indeed. That's a way. <laughs> <clears throat> Indeed. Excellent. Well, Carolyn, this has been a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you, Harry. It's always always good to come on and chat. So Great stuff. Good. And I'm really looking forward to to our workshops. Um, so that, that, that should be absolutely fascinating because you, you're actually getting it's a, it's a really interesting. It's going to be a really interesting workshop because it's going to we're going to take a multidisciplinary approach. There's going to be photography, there's going to be archaeology, and there's going to be archaeoastronomy as well as other bits and pieces, um, which will actually fire your imagination. And these will feed in beautifully uh, towards producing your photographs. So we won't be just taking photographs of the monuments themselves, but also of the monuments within the broader landscape and the broader landscape itself, uh, which is absolutely fascinating. So in a way, you've got the three elements to the story, the monument, the location of the monuments within the landscape and the broader landscape itself. So, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Anything like, else you'd like to add? No, I, I think we're there, Harry. So That's okay. fantastic. Once again, Carolyn, thank you so much. It's great to see you. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll draw tonight to a close. Bye, Carolyn. Bye. Great. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, fascinating insight into into the into the landscape of Bodmin Moor, the prehistoric landscape into the Bodmin Moor. I think what really what really um, it throws up is more questions than than, than answers. But I think it's that. Um, being able to, to to ask different questions, to ponder, and to 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 imagine. I think this is the this, this is the wonderful thing. So yeah, next week I'll be talking about my own work on photographs of Bodmin Moor, um, all of which covers most of the areas, if not all of the areas and uh, locations that we were looking at um, this evening. And I'll be showing some traditional landscapes some um, astro uh, photography uh, astrophotography as well as some of the experimental photography that i've also been conducting there long exposures and so on and so forth so uh, do join us next week same time 8 pm uk time and um, i look forward to seeing you then excellent roy thank you for your comment thanks carolyn that's great thank you for being here roy fantastic Excellent. Okay, you have a very good, very good evening. Have a great week ahead. And thank you so much. Good night. Bye for now.